Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new Earth Lawyer podcast, where we feature lawyers who are changing the practice of law to change the world. My name is Geraldine Jones Putra. I'm your host, and I am a lawyer. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. Today, we have with us Peter Lustig. He's a collaborative practitioner, he's a mediator, a lawyer, a coach. He's also based in Melbourne, Australia. Peter has been a lawyer for over four decades. He specializes in, in, in family law, employment law, estate planning, construction uh, and disputes. In the time of being a lawyer for the four decades, he says he has transitioned from being a head kicking adversarial gun for hire towards a more human approach of helping people understand why conflict is in their lives and what it's there to teach them. Peter, it's a real privilege to have you. Welcome. Thank you. It feels like a privilege to be here too. <laughs> I am very interested, and I think people listening or watching this would be very interested in hearing about that transition from the head kicker to uh, the more human approach. Could you tell us your story, what, what set off the transition? Well, I think what set it off is probably my childhood and, and, and trauma and my experiences and how I dealt with them mm. um, back then. Um, it made me into, um, everyone knows about the f f flight or f fright or freeze reactions when confronted with conflict. Um, so as a younger man, certainly, or as a teenager and as a younger man, um, when confronted with, with some sort of conflict, um, somebody would sort of put their hand on their sword hilt and I would bring out my thermonuclear devices. <laughs> you know, yeah. Fairly typical for, for many adversarial lawyers and for a lot of us as well, you know, us human beings. And, and that was probably my, my own defences rocking in, you know, whether I was aware of it or not. And, and I got pretty good at it. You know, I'm, I'm sure there were lots, lots, lots of lawyers around who were even better at it than me. Um, and there was a lot of arrogance in that, a huge amount. Uh, and at the end of the day, that arrogance, I think, cost me and I think cost our clients and cost our culture yeah. a whole heap of, of pain uh, that, was, that I now see was probably unnecessary. And were you, were you feeling a strong attachment to the identity of being a lawyer and being able to oh, explode these, de being, these devices? Being a lawyer is so imbued in my ego. Uh, yeah. it, it's a huge mask. And, and um, as, as I was saying uh, before we started recording, right at the moment I'm in the midst of seriously questioning whether I want to continue, uh, at least in the way that I am. Um, and, um, you know, what's, what's in the rest of my life for me at this point? Yeah. So um, I'm reading a beautiful book uh, called Soulcraft by um, uh, a, a fellow named Bill Plotkin. And, oh, yeah. Um, it's a beautiful journey um, and about creating your own rites of passage. And at the moment I'm right in the midst of s separation or, if you like, dissolution. You know, who am I really? And that would probably, I imagine, include the mask of, um, you know, I'm a bloke who looks like I'm a bloke and I look like I, well, to some anyway, uh, I've got all my shit together and uh, I know what I'm doing. And that's probably true in many respects. Um, and it doesn't necessarily directly or even indirectly address the existential questions of um, why am I here, what am I doing, and what's my purpose, um, whereas once upon a time there, there was a lot of that in my life. So what I found, I've also been in, a, in places, uh, as I said to you before we started recording, at least twice I've questioned my own position, whether I want to continue being a lawyer. And what I found is that there's a, there's a sort of spiral uh, to life, that we go round and around mm. and around, and we should actually, with, with each revisiting of the issues we hopefully are a little bit higher up on the spiral, so we're revisiting with some knowledge and some wisdom collected along the way. But we're still coming back to the and, same place. Yeah. And, and it, well, not, not only knowledge and wisdom, but the wisdom actually includes more tools on board, mm. you know, for, yeah. for doing my own work. 
Yeah. Um, and probably that, that's, you know, coming back to your original question, that's probably one of the jumping off points, if you like, for me moving, you know, from being an adversarial lawyer uh, towards being more of a collaborative practitioner, um, doing my own inner work and appreciating that uh, a lot of what I was doing was actually helping people to maintain their own egos. Um, mm -hmm. And what I was seeing that many people got into trouble uh, or, or, or in contact, if you like, with the law and, and had to address something with legal sequelae to it um, by virtue of them holding tightly to their ego and not wanting necessarily to learn perhaps the lessons um, that were there to for, for them to learn. Yeah. So, so an example might be, um, I remember a, a client came in together with his wife um, the deal was that he had uh, gone guarantor for his older brother and his older brother, of course, had, had done a runner or gone bankrupt or whatever it was and mm. he was left holding the bag you know, to a significant extent. And um, when I asked him about it, he told me, yes, indeed, he did love his older brother um, and he would do anything for him. And indeed, the doing anything for him had resulted in him uh, perhaps inappropriately going guarantor for his brother when he didn't know what the risks were necessarily. And when I asked, it, it, I remember being quite stunned that I, I said, uh, has this happened before? And he said, yes. Or rather, actually, no, he didn't say yes, his wife did. Yeah, okay. His wife said yes, because he was a bit blind to it. And I said, oh, okay, so previously it's not been as big or serious as this. And, and, and the answer was no, it hadn't been. And each time it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, coming through ne not necessarily in the same way, but each time his lack of an appropriate and clean and clear and, and nevertheless loved boundary with his older brother was getting him deeper and deeper and deeper into, you know, the mud. Yeah. Um, Yep, yeah, to the point so, where so what, conflict was was arising in his life and he couldn't ignore it anymore. Well, that's that's exactly right. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people, in fact, if not a lot of people, everyone in yeah. some way or another, you know, whether, whether it necessarily involves us in uh, engaging within the legal system um, or just in relationships. And this, sure is, this is where, as I move in into speaking to more people with this podcast, the the parallels between our profession and the medical profession keep jumping out to me, right? Because a lot of us express issues that need our attention, uh, not just through conflict. The other way it expresses is through disease. Yeah. So then we come into interaction with the medical profession. The medical profession is well, a healing well, profession or holds itself out to be, but we also have a healing role. Yeah, oh, absolutely. In, and in fact, I would suggest that, I do suggest that it's not just the medical profession, it's the, the wellbeing um, zeitgeist, if you like. Yeah. Um, coming again back to your original <laughs> question. Yes. Uh, I've been uh, um, an amateur student of process oriented psychology for, I don't know, three decades maybe. Uh huh. And and could you tell us about process oriented psychology? Oh, I'm not familiar work, with it. Process work was uh, originated by a guy named Arnie Mendel. Um, mm -hmm. He's still around. He's a beautiful man, incredibly intelligent. Um, and he he was, I believe, a um, uh, an, some sort of physicist, if I recall correctly. And um, and he eventually became a Jungian psychologist and decided that they were way too tame for him. Yeah. Uh, and so he branched out and, and into what is now known as um, process-oriented psychology. And um, one of his very, very early works was uh, around the, the connection between body symptoms and what's actually going on in, inside. And, yeah. and it's exactly as you were saying. So in, in the strictly medical sphere, um, people come out with, with physical ailments and the interesting question is, how come? You know, why, you know, we, because we can treat those sorts of things topically, you know, by treating the symptoms, right? Whereas um, process work and, and indeed the law, as I reckon it ought to be practised, and indeed relationships might be saying, well, how come I've got that symptom? Yeah. 
what, what is it that inside of me that I'm I'm not listening to or that I'm or outside of me that is going on by reason of which that symptom is present, which is really, um, I'm sure you're, <clears throat> you've heard of, the, the, there's a book, I'm not sure who was the author, but it's called, I think, The Body Knows. So the body reacts to what is actually going on, even if my mind is able to completely shut it out and ignore it or, or push it into shadow, into my unconscious. Yes. And so the, the parallels are beautiful, they're absolutely there um, in as much as, the more I learn about my own inner world, um, the more I'm hopefully able to to see what's actually going on and, and to actually own my own shadows. Mm. Like everyone, I've got shadows that I'm unaware of as well. I, I have a, a young um, a young son who, um, well, in his early 20s now, and he and I had um, quite a... Uh, uh, an interaction on Sunday when we were, we were going for a walk with my daughter and um, in a park, and, and he was insisting that there were parts of me that I wasn't taking responsibility for, doing things that um, were ignoring the impacts of what I was doing on other people. Mm. It, was, it was really very, very um, strenuous about it and yeah that was incredibly uncomfortable for me to, to hear that from somebody who knows me probably just about better than anyone on the planet so so, so it, it's, it's it was forcing me because i love him so much and because i knew that he was coming from a place of loving me um it was effectively saying to me hey what's going on here hmm. What is it that I'm ignoring? And, and, and if I can return <laughs> to your question, that's exactly what happens with with people who have disputes, which end up having legal content. You know, what I what I what I see is that they come to a lawyer, and, and and totally understandably, people just want legal issues gone. They want them solved. They either want the money or they want to be, you know, they don't want to be harassed for something or other. Yeah. And all of that stuff is able to be dealt with just by time, money and, and emotions. So was it something that occurred within you and then with your inner reflections you began to see how it was playing out around you or, or was it more of a case that what was being expressed outside of you, the conflict that people were having, maybe conflicts resolved, but that's just treating the symptom and not having the, the deeper issues resolved. And then it made you reflect. So which was it? Was it the inner first or? I think it was both. Yeah. And, and there was the, the, the external was as well, um, seeing the damage that adversarial litigation does. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's a dance. It's, it's in one sense a game. Um, yeah. It's a game where um, we, as lawyers and the clients, of course, are, are playing with lives and having real consequences that can be incredibly devastating for people. Um, and, and even the process itself can, can be harmful and, and can be traumatising and re-traumatising even. Yes. And seeing more and more, I was seeing that that particular dance wasn't necessarily addressing what the core issues were. And those core issues were how come this dispute has arisen in the first place? Yeah. Now, there's another interesting parallel uh, with the, the medical world, and that phrase comes to mind, a physician, heal thyself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you about uh, an incident that happened in your life, which was the dispute that you got into, where you actually found yourself uh, very much enmeshed in a legal issue with Qantas. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, that was that went for years. It, it was a yeah. significant part of your life. What did you learn from being so um, enmeshed in that battle? Well, uh, on the surface, I can say that Qantas makes more in, in, in a week that I'll probably make in my life or, or right at the moment in the midst of COVID. Perhaps that's not quite true, but um, <clears throat> I think about two or three years ago when, when this all ended, they were posting profits of half a million uh, for, you know, for a half year. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm going to make anything close to that in the whole of my lifetime or even 10 times that. So um, on that surface level, 
uh, be careful about who you pick a fight with. This is a big lesson for me. Mm -hmm. uh, below that, um, it was incredibly disappointing. Um, you and I were speaking before we started recording about this almost uh, fanatical um, allegiance that many Australians, myself then included, have to Qantas. Yeah, um, it's emotional. Ads, yeah, and the ads that they did were such, they were gorgeous, you know, like Qantas is the spirit of Australia, you know, and, it was, and, and, and I told you the story of how I once got a free flight with the then ANSET and I felt disloyal, even though they upgraded me to business class, you know. I mean, yeah. how weird is that? And so, and I was a, um, a Qantas Club member. Um, I was travelling with a client who was... Um, who very frequently travels uh, on Qantas alone. Um, and we got into a dispute in, in that um, uh, I wanted to hang um, a couple of dinner suits, uh, which I had with me, one for myself, one for my oldest son. And we had been to a gallery opening of my, my wife mm -hmm. uh, the night before where we'd borne them. I wanted to hang them in the suit, in, in the hanging locker. And the, um, it was in the midst of a baggage handler strike and so everyone was a bit tetchy, uh, or at least that's my impression. Yeah. We'd been waiting a long time uh, over, overly to board. Okay, so and there was a delay as well, a flight yeah, delay. All of that. And, and Didn't help. The, um, the cabin, the, the man who was in charge of the, the cabin, um, a steward, um, customer service manager is what they called him, mm. um, said, you can't do that, it's full. And uh, my friend, sat, uh, being a frequent fire, much more frequent fire than me, thought that's a bit strange. Most of business class was, you know, well, business class there was half empty. Um, the flight wasn't totally full. Uh, he opened the door and it was actually empty. There yeah. Were coat hangers hanging in there. And um, he, he he said something to the CSM like, um, or, or to me, but in a loud loudish voice, uh, He's a liar. You know, this is this is totally empty. And of course, the CSM took offence at that and, and asked him to step outside um, onto the uh, um, outside of the aircraft, but still on the aero bridge. Um, I got back out there just in time to see him poking my friend in the chest, mm. saying, I, d "I don't like being told I'm a liar in front of my crew." Mm. Mm. My friend who. Um, I thought uh, I was concerned that it would become really physical, but my friend said, "Well, you know, I don't like being <laughs> you've been told a lie." Um, with that, the the CSM said, "Well, you're not going to fly to to Melbourne." And this was in Sydney. Yeah. And my friend said, "Well, that's ridiculous. Um, look, um, I'm going to go and sit down, talk to this bloke. He's my lawyer." <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so yeah, then you, you were right I'm, into the conflict at that point. I smiled on me big time. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so it escalated. Uh, it there escalated. were criminal proceedings and then oh. later on there were civil proceedings as well. Yeah. Did you feel uh, as, as someone who was at the end of, in some cases, or as, especially in the criminal proceedings, um, at the end of the, the the legal process, how did it make you feel? Did it make you identify more with your clients being in, yes. embroiled in this? You know, in yeah. a word, yes, very yeah. much. So. Although you know, I, I I don't really do very much criminal work at all. Maybe yeah. you know, one or two relatively minor traffic type cases a year, if that. Um, but yeah, being on the, on the end of um, a, a fairly hefty proceeding, you know, mm. where it's facing a fourteen year felony charge. Yeah, um, I, I can only imagine how stressful that would have been. Course of their performance of duties or functions in relation to an operational aircraft. Mm. Um, poof, it was an, a piece of anti-terrorist legislation, and that was like the furthest thing from our minds. And, yeah. And, um, so so being at that end of it, the wrong end of it. Uh, it's frightening, mm. it's hugely expensive. Mm. Um, I, I have no doubt it would have cost Qantas easily half a mil. Mm. Um, it certainly cost me um, easily that, um, both in money's outlaid for, for counsel and, and the rest, um, and also lost time. Yeah. Uh, a huge, enormous input into it. Well, um, the 
it, obviously it, it uh, drained your resources uh, monetary and emotionally. But at the end of it, you were cleared. You won on appeal, which is great news. So that the law has managed to keep you as a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, and then the civil proceedings went through uh, where there was a dispute over the, the frequent flyer points that... Not quite. Uh, we decided to go to VCAT, um, uh -huh. Civil and Administrative Tribunal, and uh, to deliberately ask for um, something for less than $10,000. Yeah. Because that is then a no-cost jurisdiction in VCAT. Yes. Um, and so we asked for reinstatement to the Frequent Flyers Club and, and, and a number of, quite a number of frequent flyer points um, to... Uh, and, in fact, Qantas had said um, its head of group security had written to us at one point saying... Um, Qantas takes very, very seriously all issues to do with passenger safety and comfort. Mm. It's a lovely motherhood statement. And I wrote, remember writing back and saying, well, if that's so, why won't you even listen to me or to us when we would like to tell you what really happened? It turned out that they had, they had um, got, gotten reports that we were um, interfering with or attacking female captain crew and stuff like this. It was just completely, completely off the radar and, inac and inaccurate. Yeah. Anyway, so we wanted them to remove the don't ever fly with us or darken our, the doorway of any of our services again letter. So, mm -hmm. um, and they had, they had committed, you know, once all the criminal stuff was dealt with to reviewing it, which they hadn't really done. Yeah. So right. um, we, we asked for that. And um, sadly, um, Qantas brought an application to effectively say that VCAT didn't have jurisdiction. That was refused. And um, rather than appealing it to the Supreme Court, they issued new um, proceedings in the federal court uh -huh. challenging that, saying that the cause of action arose on Commonwealth territory. And as a result, uh, VCAT didn't have jurisdiction to be able to deal with it. And they won on that point? Very sadly, they won on that point. I see. It's so, okay, obviously a few twists and turns in that. Where would you put that experience, massive experience clearly relative to, to everything else going on in your life, in your journey okay. to... Um, in a nutshell, uh, it was hugely humbling. Oh, Okay. And having to deal with the stress and the and the financial impacts and the time impacts, hmm. um, and also to fight a monolith, it was incredibly humbling. And I think it brought me down two or three notches. And as much as I might not have liked the methodology uh, or the process, um, I think it helped me to become a, a better human being in the end, more empathetic and more compassionate, both towards myself and towards others. If I had my time again, I would have said to this customer service manager, "My gosh, um, we're so sorry. You know what can we? You know, it, it, it was an entitlement argument as against a relational one." Yes, yes. yes. So, so, yeah. So a bit of a sliding doors moment, which yeah. happens to all of us. Yeah. But in your case, it, it yeah. led down, I, I, led you down I, a certain path. One other, yes, and one other point about it is that um, it, it's a real shame because Qantas lost out big time. You know, they've got now two customers, two former frequent flyer customers um, who would have been spending many, many thousands of dollars with them and, and both of us are now flying with a, a, an alternate airline very happily. In fact, we, we had to buy ourselves some tickets um, on Virgin to, to get back to Melbourne although we'd been promised we'd be on the next Qantas flight um, if we got off of, off the aircraft, which we did, and then they reneged on that. But um, happily, Virgin upgraded us. Yeah, <laughs> and that was the beginning of another loyalty story with yeah, another brand. Absolutely, yeah. and, and all the way through we were seeking dialogue and, and being able to, can we talk? And it would never, ever, ever, ever happen, ever. Mm. It was only about entitlements and as a, a friend of mine who started Salesforce, I used to say it always costs a company more to get a new customer in than it does to retain one. 
Yeah. Well, Peter, I really want to thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, that story actually has a lot of lessons in it for not just the lessons you took away, but for Qantas as well. Uh, we could talk also about the, the whole Do you think presentation of a, of, a, of, a, of a corporation and their fight for loyalty with customers and so on. But I wanted to go to, into another direction now, and that's the work you do with uh, men's groups and you are the immediate past chair of uh, mankind project australia it's yeah. a charity which runs adult male right of passage programs yes. i really want to get into this i have had a, a mix of male and female guests on this podcast and i've actually intentionally tried to mix them up and I do really want to get into this particular topic about what it's teaching you in your legal practice and how it's helping you to transform it and transform your clients. Uh, well, being chair, I don't think did any of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but being involved in the project did. Um, so this was uh, um, back in 2005, I think, um, I trained with an organisation called Pathways Foundation, which is a national not-for-profit as well, a charity, uh, which does contemporary rites of passage for young people stepping into adulthood. How that looks is for, for, for boys, it's going out into the bush for maybe a week with your dad or uh, uh, perhaps a grandfather or uncle and um, doing a rite of passage, which is uh, separating from your community um, being faced ultimately with some existential type questions like being challenged, um, somehow or other finding your own inner resources to meet that challenge, and then integrating it and then returning back to your community and being witnessed for who you've now become. Yeah. So that's the traditional rite of passage, um, descent and, and return, if you like, that uh, Joseph Campbell wrote about many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> the, um, the Mankind Project is a, a, an international brotherhood. Uh, it operates in 30-plus countries, I think, something like that. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and essentially it's an adult male rite of passage program. So it takes men who, you know, for any age from about 16, 17 um, onwards, and takes them over a weekend through about 60 different processes which follow that same pattern. And it's completely voluntary um, in the sense that each man can go as deep within himself as he chooses. Uh, and it's in a very, very held space. There, there are often 20 to 30 or 40 men who are participants in these programs. And in one or so with 40, there might be anywhere between 60, 70, 80 other men who've previously staffed on these trainings uh, or previously gone through it themselves uh, who hold the space for them and, and lead them through those program, those processes. Um, it's, it's incredible the way that it works. Mm -hmm. And when, when men come back from it, rather than, um, rather than forgetting about this, you know, a few months later and, you know, that was all rah-rah and terrific and I learned all this stuff and now a few months later I'm going to forget it. We have what are called I groups or integration groups um, so that once you, you've completed your training, you can come into an I group and continue doing the sort of work and using the inner working tools that, that you learn on the program to meet the challenges that, that you meet daily in your lives. Um, I, I did the program back in 2010, and um, I've been going to an I group ever since. Yeah. Uh, back then, most I groups were closed, or if you like, only open to men who'd done the training. Uh, these days, most of them are open, so any man can can rock along if they'd like. And so, it I imagine that it ends up healing the individual, uh, really improving their relationships with the immediate family and loved ones, but also gives them a different sense of their place in the community. So their interactions with the wider community at their jobs or at their clubs, their, their sporting clubs or, or whatever else. 
Yeah, well, the, the program is very much designed to, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, ensure that things like head, heart and belly are in alignment. Mm-hmm. Um, so because when they're not, that's when we do, well, that's when I do things um, that I'm unconscious about and I can damage myself and other people yeah. being unconscious about it. Yeah. And, and it can also mean you know, that's the times, as we were speaking earlier, when I can end up with illnesses and sicknesses because there's part of me wanting to go one way and part wanting to go another, whether I, I'm aware of that or not. So what it leads to is, is men becoming way more authentic in their own lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The more authentic I am, the more congruent I am in who I am and who I'm being, the more aligned I am with what it is that I want to do in the world. And indeed, during during the um, the training, men also get a mission, or if they've already got a mission, they get another one or, or a refinement of it. Yeah, which is really directed towards the masculine uh, the masculine perspective, right, of being directed, of being goal-oriented. No, that's, that's in stereotypical terms, that's the dynamic. Yeah. Obviously, we, all, we each have masculine and feminine impulses within us, but if you're embodied as a man, then the masculine one's impulses are going to be more overt. So it's actually giving a channel to that. It's partly that, and, and, and indeed some more parts of the training and, and of the activities in the I-group. Um, for example, in the I-group, uh, we do what's called a check-in. Mm-hmm. So check-in is me saying my name, uh, a spirit name if I have one and I'd like to share it. Mm-hmm. What's going on in my body from here down, you know, from my neck down? And why? Why talk about feelings and where are they? It's, it's to enhance a capacity for emotional fluidity and intelligence. Why? Because the more aware I am of what's going on, on inside my body, the more I can own it and, and, and be out in the world do, being those things and noticing what's actually what's actually going on. Right. Which ties back nicely to that conversation we are having earlier about conflict. Yeah. So yeah. recognising when the external manifestation of something is presenting itself as a conflict, but it's actually you can identify where in your body it's hitting you, hurting you. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure I have no doubt that every single person listening to this and you and I both included would have had um, some sort of argument with a a partner or, you know, in a close relationship at some point or other. Mm -hmm. How many times have I projected what's going on inside of me without acknowledging it and said it's all your fault? Yeah. If you only stopped doing this, if you only did do that, you know, we would have a beautiful relationship. I would be happy. No? Yes. So that's that's called projection. And and what it is is it's saying there's something inside here which I haven't owned completely or which I am disowning, if you like, or which is in shadow. And when I do own it, it's probably there because of some sort of childhood um, incident which which had me decide that what I want is love and or I want to avoid pain or a combination of them. And so I decide to, to be in the world in a particular way. So, and, you know, one of the ways in which I used to do that was to be fairly, fairly full-on aggressive and heat-kicking, as, as we were speaking earlier. I have found in my experiences working with g- groups that are mixed as well as women's groups, that women, when they're confronted with this idea that the the conflict arises from within, tend to have to show themselves love. Uh, and, And many women can identify with that when they begin to see themselves as a child, inner child, and then they love, they use their maternal instincts to love the inner child back into a feeling of peace and acceptance. Um, is it the same for men or do men apply a male impulse of fixing it so that they then apply that to whatever <laughs> is wounded in them to fix it? Yeah, it's such a such a strong uh, cultural thing. Yeah. Um, there's a terrific YouTube thing called The Nail, uh, which if, if anyone is listening to this uh, hasn't seen it, just Google The Nail and have a watch of it and it's where a couple of trying to, um, she's trying to say, I just want to be heard. He's trying to say, I just want to fix it for you. 
you know, and she's saying, shut up, just listen to me, you know. Um, so to answer your question, um, yeah, there is a propensity for, for me and, and many men to just want to get things done mm-hmm. rather than being. And sadly, in, in some respects, that makes us human d- doings rather than human beings. Um, yeah. And, uh yeah. There was there was a, a thing that's been on my mind as you've been talking, and that is given the situation, we're both in Melbourne, uh, so we've tolerated uh, extended lockdowns. So the situation that's been on my mind that I wanted to ask you about as you work within these men's groups is does the lack of control that many of us feel faced with, you know, we're, we're being told to sit in our homes, we can only go out a certain distance or for certain reasons. It's impacting the way we run our careers and our contribution to the community. Are you seeing in men's groups that that lack of control of your own life is really impacting men? How is it impacting men? I think it's like any sort of pressure cooker. Um, and we're seeing this in, in, in the incidence of domestic violence. Um, yeah going both ways, Um, separations and and all the rest of it. Um, When when I'm in a relationship and I'm I'm caught in a a confined space, uh, either time-wise or physically, uh, as as we are at the moment to some extent in lockdown, uh, it just exacerbates the things that make make us, lead us into conflict, right? And, And... when, when, when I'm not acknowledging what's actually going on inside of me, what I will try to do is try to control what's going on for the other person. Mm. And, and as lawyers, we, we, that, that's, that's what we do. We, we get into a court and we have this amazing arm wrestle where one side is trying to control not only the story uh, and the context, but also the outcome. Yeah. And the other side is trying to do the same at the same time. Yeah. So... In, in lockdown, what tends to happen is these there are no outward uh, distractions like work or going to the movies or, or necessarily perhaps running or, or whatever it is that you do to distract yourself from what's actually going on inside. Mm. So control becomes a, a way bigger issue. Um, one, one, of, um, one mentor of mine talks about um, when I'm triggered by something, um, that's an opportunity for me to bring love and healing and compassion to that part of me that is being triggered. So you do or say something that has me go, <coughs> and I, 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 I might, if I, if I have those skills and that awareness, have the capacity to look inside and say, hey, what's, what's, what's doing that? You know, yeah. what's driving that inside here? Yeah. Yeah. That's very wise advice. I was going to ask you a final question. Um, given all of your experience and we've touched on all of the, the things that have impacted you in the last decades, any advice for young would-be head kickers uh, who are wondering, is this for me, the law, uh, all of your your wisdom garnered from your years, what would you say to young ones who are thinking maybe there's another way to practice law? Well, there certainly is. Uh, and it's not really another way to practice law, in my view. It's another mm. way to be a human being. Mm. Uh, and what I'm seeing increasingly in the younger generations is that men and women together seem to be way, way, way more conscious of what's going on in the world, what's going on inside of them. Yep. And uh. There's been a, um, it's been pretty you know, popular uh, over the last, say, decade, uh, this whole idea of uh, wellness and, and, and mindfulness. And really, those are, 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 are beautiful concepts uh, which, which have people simply be more conscious of who they are as human beings. And it seems to me that the more rounded people are, the more they're more able to take on board whatever is going on and... and and not necessarily take it personally as well, uh, the better they're going to be as, as, as citizens in our, in our countries uh, and, and indeed as lawyers. Yeah, so it's all about being a better human being and by extension, whatever roles you play, 
daughter, son, mother, father, sister, brother, friend, lawyer, doctor, you'll be better at it. Can I also add one more thing as well, uh, not directly answering that question. Uh, mm. It seems to me that when there's conflict and if if people can actually own that, that it's not all the other person's fault. Right? Yes. Uh, so to take it back to Qantas, it, it, it wasn't the the customer service manager's fault. You know, he, he got really upset. It was ours as well, or mine as well, in the, in the way that I was dealing with him. And, and I certainly, you know, I mentioned arrogance, for example, and, and to some extent there was a lot of disrespect in that. Right? So I was insisting on rights rather than looking at relationship. So what often happens in conflicts is um, it's a, you owe me this, or I'm not, <laughs> I'm not liable in the way that you're saying. Um, I, I remember having a um, dealing with a partnership dispute a little while ago, and the two men who were involved had, had built up a very very successful business that was turning over millions, and it was um, it, it, it was almost stultified because they were such loggerheads. They'd been together for fifteen years, mm. but when we finally got together and and addressed it. Um, we worked through a number of issues and there was uh, only a couple left. And the question to, the, that was asked was, um, look at the man sitting opposite you. Um, he has been your partner for 15 years. Um, you and he and your families have gone out on innumerable occasions together. Um, you, your children, uh, he is godfather to your children. And almost all of the material wealth that you are presently enjoying is as a result of that man's input. Hmm. So what is it not that you want from this man, but what is it that you might give to him? And that's when we were talking about the price, the buyout price, and, and we were able to agree on it like inside of moments. Yeah, so even so, something as... as fundamental as price, you know, as transactional as price, comes back down to the relationship and the history between people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, for example, in a collaboration, um, uh, a family law collaboration, um, the couple were saying, um, you know, we'd like to, to resolve this fairly quickly. And we ended up uh, suggesting that, they write down on a piece of paper the same thing, not what they wanted from the, from each other, but what they would be prepared to give to each other. Mm. And mm. we came back together. Uh, we gave the two pieces of folded up paper to the neutral facilitator. Yeah. And she, she opened them up and she said, oh, one's got, one's included the loan and one hasn't. And so being, being a finance professional she was very quickly able to get them to common denominators and then she goes oh you're only 10 grand apart whereupon the woman this was in a you know fairly significant estate and uh, the woman suddenly burst out laughing, uh, burst out crying and we just all of us just held space yeah and she kept on crying and then after a little while somebody asked um Please don't stop, you know, you know, whatever you're expressing, go, go with it. And when you're ready, we're all curious as to what's going on for you. And she, she continued crying for a little bit and then she looked up at her husband and, and, she, and with tears in her eyes, she said, I had no idea that you would ever be so generous. I accept. Thank you. It was like... Remarkable. One of those moments that takes your breath away. Hmm. And, and with lawyering, conflict resolution. That was a resolution. It wasn't a settlement. Mm -hmm. Peter, thank you for a uh, really deep interview. I've enjoyed hearing the stories that you've related, your personal ones as well as the ones you've kindly shared with your clients. Um, thank you for joining us. Can I put in a quick ad before yeah, we end? please. Thank you. Just anyone who's interested, um, Mankind Project Australia is mkpau.org. Um, and I, I facilitate a weekly um, 
spy group, a circle of men sitting in circle uh, on Zoom. And when lockdown ends, um, that alternates fortnightly with a face-to-face one. So um, I think there is some, I'm pretty sure there are some links to that on my website. So if anyone's interested, please be in touch. I'll make sure to include the links as well on the episode page for this episode, Peter, so that people can check it out. All right. Thank you for sharing space. Yeah, thank you.